Welcome back to Representation Learning. This video will cover Principal Component Analysis, or PCA. PCA is an unsupervised method of dimensionality reduction. Having a large number of features can make it challenging to train a classifier. We will use PCA to reduce the number of features, which is the same as the dimensionality of the data. First, let's review eigenvalues and eigenvectors, as they're essential for PCA. Remember that an eigenvector and an eigenvalue correspond to a matrix. They don't just exist on their own. A matrix has eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and a vector V is an eigenvector of a matrix A if A times V is equal to a scalar times V. That scalar is called an eigenvalue, and it is represented by lambda. Remember, eigenvectors and eigenvalues do not exist without a transformation. This transformation is a matrix, A. An eigenvector V is one that doesn't change direction when the transformation A is applied. It simply changes length. Each eigenvector has a corresponding eigenvalue. How do we calculate eigenvectors and eigenvalues? Using the so-called characteristic equation. We have A, subtract lambda times I, and then take the determinant of that. Set it equal to zero and solve for the eigenvalues. Remember, I is just the identity matrix. Once we have the eigenvalues, we can find the eigenvectors quite easily. Let's do an example to solidify this concept. We'll start with a two by two matrix A that has zero, one, negative two, and negative three in it. We take A, subtract lambda times I, which ends up being a square matrix with lambdas on the diagonal, and then we take the determinant of the resulting matrix and set it equal to zero. Remember, the determinant of a two by two matrix is the diagonals multiplied together, and then the second diagonal is subtracted from the first. So we take this diagonal here, multiply these two elements together, and subtract these two diagonal elements multiplied together. This gives us a quadratic equation in terms of lambda. We can factor this or use the quadratic formula to find our two lambda values. Here we have lambda 1 equals negative 1 and lambda 2 equals negative 2. Now we need to plug these eigenvalues into the original equation AV equals lambda V to solve for V. There are many ways to do this. Here we move all terms to one side of the equation so we can combine the terms with V in them. Then we plug in our lambda 1 value and we get this equation here. We've expanded V1 into V11 and V12, so we can actually perform the matrix multiplication and solve for V11 and V12. This gives us a system of equations, and we can solve for V11 and V12. You will see that the two equations will give us the same result. This is because a scalar multiple of an eigenvector is still an eigenvector, so it is up to us to choose a V that satisfies this equation. Choosing V equals one, negative one works. This little K1 in front is just saying what I just said, which is that any scalar multiple will work. Now we do the same thing for V2 and we get V2 equals one, negative two. We typically want to normalize eigenvectors. We want them to have a length of one. We can get them to have a length of one by dividing by their length. So we take V1 and we divide by the length of V1. What is length? The L2 norm. We do the same thing with V2 and this is what we get. Now that we're all comfortable with eigenvectors and eigenvalues again, we can jump right into the PCA algorithm. There are eight steps to the algorithm as we'll cover it in this class. You will see many variations of this algorithm. Some will have four steps, some will have 12. It's all the same stuff, just split up differently. Step one, calculate the average for each feature. This will be denoted by X with a little bar over it. Step two, subtract the mean feature from every sample. Step three, divide each feature by its standard deviation. We now have a new matrix Z to represent our data, which has been centered and standardized. Step four, compute and the covariance matrix using Z transpose Z. Step five, compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. Step six, 
sort the eigenvalues along with the eigenvectors from largest to smallest. Step seven, select the K eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues. We will call this smaller matrix U. Step eight, project the data onto U. This gives us our data in a new space that has a reduced number of dimensions. Let's go through an example to see that it isn't all bad. We have some two-dimensional data. This just means that we have two features, x1 and x2. I have the data in a table here on the left and plotted on the right. First, we need to calculate the average for each feature. We get that the average for x1 is 3.07 and the average for x2 is 3.23. Now we need to subtract the mean of each feature from every sample. And we get this new data on the right. This data is referred to as centered because if we were to calculate the mean of both features now, we would get zero. So we shifted the data to the origin or we centered it. Here's the centered data plotted. Next, we need to divide each feature by its standard deviation. Remember that the standard deviation is calculated like this. You take every sample, subtract the mean, and square the result, summing them all up, dividing by the number of samples, and taking the square root. Lucky for us, we have already subtracted the mean. We find that the standard deviation of feature 1 is 1.44, and the standard deviation of feature 2 is 1.96. Dividing by the standard deviation, we now have the data on the right. This becomes our Z matrix, which is our original data centered and standardized. We're done with all of the data pre-processing, so now we can get to the meat of the algorithm. We need to compute our covariance matrix. The covariance matrix is computed by Z transpose Z. This just gives us some sense of how the features vary with respect to each other. This operation will give us a two by two matrix. If we had D features instead of two, we would get a D by D matrix as our covariance matrix. Now we compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. We have our eigenvector equation on the left with A replaced with the covariance matrix Z transpose Z. We use the characteristic equation. Reducing the left side of the equation gives us this. Taking the determinant gives us this equation. Reducing that gives us a quadratic equation that is set to zero. Using the quadratic formula, we get the following eigenvalues. Lambda 1 equals 13.2 and lambda 2 equals negative 0.09. Now we need to plug these eigenvalues in and solve for the eigenvectors. We start with the first largest eigenvector. We reduce the equation and we find that V1 is 7.31. Repeating this process to find the second eigenvector, we get V2 equals negative 0.841. On to step six. We need to sort the eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors from largest to smallest. Here, this is trivial because we only have two eigenvectors. The first one is associated with the largest eigenvalue of 13.29. The second one has an eigenvalue of negative 0.09. I almost forgot a step. Don't forget to normalize the eigenvectors so they have length one. Now we need to select the K largest eigenvectors and construct the matrix U. Since we only have two dimensions, let's see what our data looks like in one dimension. So we'll choose K equals one. Finally, we project the data onto U. U represents the lower dimensional space. We'll do this with a simple matrix multiplication operation, resulting in the data on the right. We have the original data plotted on the gray background and then projected data on the white background below it. The eigenvectors that are extracted using this method are actually called principal components. They describe the variance in the data. If we look at the data, we can see that the data varies the most in this direction, with a little bit of variance in this direction. 
The first principal component, the one with the largest eigenvalue, describes the direction of the greatest variance. And we plot it here and we see that that's true. The second principal component describes the direction with the second greatest variance. The principal components will always be perpendicular or orthogonal. That's pretty much it for the standard PCA algorithm. There are many different variants of the algorithm, one of which involves kernels. I'm going to work under the assumption that you remember kernels for the most part. If you do not, make sure you review that material on Web Campus. Kernel PCA is for data that is not linearly separable in the original space. Sometimes the original PCA algorithm doesn't give you anything useful. So you add a kernel to take advantage of higher dimensional space. If we project the data into three dimensions, we can see that we have linear separability now. So if we use a kernel that takes the data from two to three dimensions, kernels are usually represented with a capital Phi. All this kernel does is it takes the original two features, x1 and x2, and creates a three-dimensional feature vector, which is x1, x2, x1 squared plus x2 squared. And now, all of a sudden, our data is linearly separable. Just a quick reminder of the kernel trick. If an algorithm can be written in terms of dot products between samples, then we can replace the dot product with a kernel to add nonlinearity without having to do computations in the expanded space. Many times, the nonlinearity expands the space too much and it becomes prohibitive. So using kernels allows us to take advantage of this nonlinearity without increased computation time. A kernel is any function that can be written in terms of dot products between samples. How do we do PCA in the new feature space? Well, we have our new samples. Instead of x, we have phi of x. And we need to make sure that the mean in the new feature space is 0. This is easy to do by just subtracting the mean from each sample. So we're going to assume the mean is 0. We calculate the covariance matrix by taking dot products between samples. This is the same as z transpose z before. Try to convince yourself of that. I'm just using c here to represent the covariance matrix, and we need to calculate the eigenvectors of c. Eigenvectors of the covariance matrix can be expressed as a linear combination of features like this. We have these alpha coefficients that serve as our weights for our linear combination. We can show that this is true with a proof. Using the eigenvector equation cv equals lambda v, we can replace c with our dot product definition from slide 58. Dividing by lambda, we get v equals 1 over lambda times n times the sum over all samples of the dot product between the sample and v and the sample again. Remember that the dot product is commutative, so we can move the terms around and everything is okay. Arranging the terms in this way allows us to reduce this to a scalar which we can call alpha. And look, we have it. We have our eigenvectors expressed as a linear combination of features. Finding the eigenvectors is equivalent to finding the coefficients alpha i. Now we substitute this equation for v back into the eigenvector equation. We get the following. If we rearrange the terms a little bit, we get this. And look, here's a kernel. We're happy about this. But we still have samples floating around. We don't like this. We need to figure out a way to add some more phi's in here so we can never have to explicitly compute phi and we can replace everything with kernels. We can do this by multiplying both sides by phi of x sub l, which is just another sample. Doing this gives us a squared kernel on the left and one kernel on the right. Dividing both sides by k, we get the following much simplified equation. Remember that we want our eigenvectors to be of length 1. So this means that each eigenvector v sub j dotted with itself equals 1. Remember that this is the same as the L2 norm squared. We call this our normalizing condition. Using our linear combination of features definition for v, we set that equal to 1 and we get that we need alpha k alpha to be equal to 1. 
Multiplying the following equation by alpha sub j and using the normalizing equation, we get the following. Lambda times n times alpha sub j transpose alpha sub j equals 1 for all j. Okay, this is a lot. For a new point x, its projection onto the principal components is simply this. Phi of x dot v reduces to the sum of alpha sub j times the kernel of x and all points in the training set. Look how simple it is. And now we have nonlinearity. So for data like this, it becomes this using KPCA. Using only the first principal component, we can separate this data. This video covers PCA, the steps of PCA, projecting data into a lower dimension, and using kernels to handle nonlinear data.